I would like to thank all of you, firstly, for joining this media conference, which we have organized to mark the first 100 days of the sixth governor in office. This platform is created to allow me an opportunity to share the vision of my tenure as governor of the central bank, an institution that plays an integral part in ensuring a well-functioning Namibian economy. I've organized my thoughts around some questions I thought you and the general public may ordinarily want to pose to me as the governor. So the first question that I'm hearing, so it's been 100 days since your appointment. How has the ride been thus far? The first 100 days is not the end of the ride. It's the beginning. And this journey thus far has been very humbling. Clearly, the opportunity to serve at the pinnacle of national finance during such an economically challenging time is gratifying, it's stimulating, and in some respects represents a culmination of my entire professional life. No doubt this is true not only for me, but for anyone taking up a leadership position now, whether it's in government, whether it's in private sector, whether it's in civil society. As with skillful pilots who gain their reputation by successfully navigating through storms and tempests, the greater the challenge presented in any situation, the greater the reward and benefit when the situation is mastered. I've taken the leadership role at the Bank of Namibia at the time when the world in Namibia have been hit by the deadly coronavirus with its devastating impact on the economy. Even before this health crisis, our economy was contracting, unemployment was high, and our fiscal space severely constrained, creating an almost perfect storm for us to face. It has been humbling to me as I experienced firsthand the resilience of the Namibian people who must face this situation daily while the pandemic dominates without a clear ending and who selflessly strive to save lives and the livelihoods of their compatriots. I started the, my role as governor with a clear 100-day plan which revolved around three key themes. The first one was introducing myself and aligning expectations with my key stakeholders. The second one was crafting a strategic agenda. And thirdly, communicating and starting executing the plan. I've learned early in my career as a junior manager that it's imperative to swiftly answer the question. And if you're a junior person, whether it's in business, civil society, you have been appointed, what now? That's the question. And most of the time, you actually don't know where to start. And most of the time, you de fall back to what you used to do or what you used to know. But luckily, I've learned to answer that question, and that question was embodied in the 100-day plan that I had. If you don't have a plan, what normally happens, you merely respond to what is happening around you, and you respond to everything people are bringing to you. You don't get a chance to lead. And leading involves building an aspirational agenda, creating a game plan to execute that agenda, attracting talented individuals to implement the game plan, and uniting people around that agenda. That was included in the 100-day plan that I had. After you have done that, then the management task normally begins consisting of providing the resources and environment that enables your team to win. And this winning process, you need to understand, is 75 to 80% is leadership, 20 to 25% is management. So for that, you need a clear 100-day plan. So the second question I'm getting is, any accomplishments during the short period? Yes, there were some. Since I took office, there are some short-term achievements, including crafting of a 
strategic plan for 2021. But the most accomplishments thus far have been preparatory and focused on ensuring longer term successes. The big focus I had initially was on stakeholder engagements. These are aimed at building a bridge between the bank and its constituencies, collecting intelligence relating to activities of the Monetary Policy Committee, the Financial Stability Mandate, and operations of the economy in general. In this regard, I have met with the top leadership of the NCCI. I've met with the top leadership of the Chamber of Mines. I have met with the top leadership of trade unions as represented by NUNW. I have met the MDs of diamond mines and diamond sales and marketing and trading companies. We are also regulating and supervising banks, so I had a walkabout. I literally visited all the systematically important financial institutions. I visited them at the banks, tried to understand what's happening, what the issues are. I've attended two MPC meetings. The first one was chaired by my deputy governor. The last one I've chaired, and we have, as you all know by now, cut interest rates by a quarter of a percent last time. And we also spend time ensuring that the relief measures we have provided to get the economy going are implemented. I have joined the club of the Common Monetary Area Central Bank Governors. I had engaged with a host of governors, current and former, on the continent and also in South America, because there are very interesting developments happening in a place like Argentina. And you want to understand what's happening there, how do they deal with that. In case we get a crisis, you know, there are some lessons that some people have learned, so we need to understand what's happening. Internally, if you come back to the bank, we have crafted the strategic plan for 2021, which will be submitted for approval during November 2020. I have met all the directors of the bank, and I've met all the deputy directors within the Bank of Namibia. I've addressed the staff of the bank, and not only introducing myself, trying to understand what's happening on the floor, what they think, how we can improve the operations of the bank. I've also reached out to my follow board members individually for the same reason. The governor served as the chairperson of the board of directors, at the same time as the de facto CEO of the bank. And for the broader economy, what we have done is we have published advisory notes on how to stimulate growth in the economy. We have been collaborating with the relevant ministries to craft a growth strategy for the country. We are looking at how we can assist SMEs together with other ministries and commercial banks through a credit guarantee scheme to see them through this current crisis. You know, there's a disproportionate heat on the lower level, the entry level of the businesses, and even on the, the populace at the, the entry level. That's quite a big heat as far as this crisis is concerned. So the question I'm also getting is, what's your vision for the bank? My vision is to help create economic prosperity for Namibia by maintaining price and financial stability. Monetary and financial stability are necessary conditions and we need to excel at it, but as I must admit that these are not sufficient conditions for long-term prosperity. In our case, we need to contribute to creating and enabling macroeconomic and financial stability environment to help grow the economy, create jobs and improve the livelihoods of the majority of our people. In addition, we need to focus on initiating requested structural reforms, pitch them to relevant policymakers, and assist with the effective implementation. This can only be possible if the Bank of Namibia is a well-run institution, internationally trusted, that is respected by its stakeholders and imbues both public trust and also the trust of its employees. 
we must build a bank where the employees are proud to work. So my goal is to continue to build the bank of Namibia into such an organization by improving and maintaining those aspirations and values of the bank, my vision would indirectly be rich through the following priorities. I basically said five priorities. Achieving and maintaining price stability is the first one. Secondly, ensuring a stable and a sound financial system. Thirdly, implementing policies that contribute towards economic growth. Fourthly, operating effectively and efficiently as a bank. And finally, investing in our employees. Many people are saying that it sounds very corporate jargon. Just tell us in simple language, what is your vision? My vision is to fix the bank, to modernize the financial system, and help secure recovery. So that is simple language. To fix the bank, modernize financial system, help secure economic recovery. So the other question that I'm also getting is, you are not a typical central banker. Why did you join the bank? You are right. It's quite a valid question. I'm not a typical central banker with a PhD in economics. But there are a number of similar examples, such as the current chairman of the United States of America Federal Reserve, the Fed, or the Central Bank of the USA. The chair of the Fed currently is a lawyer by profession. I demonstrated strong business leadership and management with an advanced understanding of financial markets and good economic knowledge. Despite this, the social science of economics has been an integral part of my academic and professional journey. Many people don't know now, I'm asking me, I've completed economics one, two, and three at undergraduate level, and later as part of my AMP at Harvard Business School. I've been following economics from the perspective of financial markets for more than 27 years, and I'm bringing applied economics to the table. There are a number of people with theoretical economics in the bank, so I'm much more the applied person. Economic models are useful and have their place, particularly in the current circumstances that we have got. But economic models built on historical events must be contextualized with practical experience when faced with a once in a century catastrophe like COVID-19. My previous experience and successes in the financial markets are well known, including my experience in the corporate world and my decision to take early retirement to start my own private equity business from scratch. So I had not gone the easy way, you know. When I started to take early retirement, I decided, do I go the tender route? I've decided most of our businesses are currently procurement based. Why don't I go and start a business with a proper value chain? So I started a business from scratch. It has become one of the go-to firms currently when it comes to private equity. Frankly, I did not have to come to the bank. Nor did I come to build a career or a name. Nor did I come here to protect some people that are outside. You know, if you make these type of sacrifices, it's for a greater purpose. And that greater purpose was to help contribute to economic prosperity. That, that's why I've come. I made personal sacrifices. I've resigned from all the boards I served on in Namibia and on the continent. And I've also taken the necessary steps to exit potential conflict of interest that I may have with my previous businesses. So why did I decide to subordinate self-interest to national interest? I was doing perfectly well. I answered the call made by the country Given the sheer scale of the unprecedented socioeconomic challenges we face, and my belief that I have the skills and the opportunity to make a contribution, the possibility to help reform the Namibian financial system to be ready for the 21st century and modernizing the operations of the bank add to the challenge and to my desire to leave the bank and the country in a better position than the one we are in now. And watch the space. Many people underestimate what I'm capable of doing. You know, everywhere I came, I just came to make sure that when I leave that place, that place will be in a much better space than I've inherited. And there's the track record out there. 
The Bank of Namibia is an independent institution and we have every intention to discharge our mandate of technical competence and independence. I've decided to go where the challenges are the greatest. The challenges we are facing are deeper and greater than most people realize. And we need everyone to make a positive contribution to overcome it. As a nation, we have demonstrated that we can, that we can summit this mountain too. Inflation is currently under control and interest rates are the lowest since independence. We are now required to support the other economic goals of government, particularly those relating to unemployment, narrowing inequality, financial stability, and the efficiency of the financial system. What are the challenges, opportunities that I see going forward? I think the management pro practices that central banks require for the future differ considerably from those they applied in the past. So we need management practices that are relevant and innovative. For example, digital transactions, sound oversight of our digital architectures, judgment calls on fintech risk, management of cybersecurity threats, and regulation of new payment operators in an increasingly cashless world are some of the challenges. What are the opportunities? I see opportunities primarily in the area of making a contribution to improve the fortunes of the economy, to create jobs and raise the living conditions of Namibia. I thank you and I'm happy to take your questions. Congratulations with your first hundred days in office. My name is Emil Seidel. I'm a reporter with the NBC News. Um, Governor, you said your mission is to fix the bank. I, but uh, you, maybe you could enlighten us which areas you want to fix and what is actually broken that needs this fixing. Um, with regards to um, the positions that you previously held on some board, you know, uh, on boards and uh, the private equity firm, is that um, there were some uh, retrenchments at some of these companies recently. And when I was busy doing these stories, um, you were referred to as the consulting person. So I would just like to know, although you have applicated your positions at this board, or uh, whether you have completely gone away, are these boards still consulting with you as to the decisions they take regarding these companies? I thank you, sir. Good morning, Governor. My name is Dwight James from Eagle FM. Um, I just have one question. Um, obviously, COVID-19 began a bit earlier. Um, before you began as, uh, as governor here at the bank, um, does it make your task slightly more a bit of an uphill fight in terms of you know the set targets that you set for yourself, uh, the, the five basic guys or the three basic guys that you mentioned in terms of fixing the bank? and then applying what you, your knowledge and your skill set to what you want to implement. Does it make that a bit more difficult? That's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Governor. My name is Kevin, also from Eagle Alpha. Um, it's a question that um, I'm putting over to you, and um, we do have you, you entering uh, the bank at a time when um, we have already experienced the storm of SME bank uh, imploding. And of course, decisions were taken by the administration uh, that you, that before you were there, but uh, do you have different perspectives in terms of how we can go forward in our attempts to recover that money? What are your thoughts about everything else to do with SME Bank, from the bank itself, uh, the fact that we do have people still that have not managed to be paid of their monies? Do you have a different approach as you come in? Do you have some thoughts about it uh, that you think uh, need to be laid out. Thank you. Thank you for your question. The first one is around vision, fixing the bank, modernizing the financial system, and securing economic recovery. There's fundamentally nothing wrong in terms of what's broken at the Bank of Namibia. It's one of the finest institutions that we have got. What I mean by fixing the bank, I mean we need to up the game. We need to ensure that Remember, if you look at the challenges that I've posed at the end, particularly the new technology that we are facing, the new world, the new challenges that we are facing, we need to make sure that this fine institution
that we have got, are probably the best competent people that we have got in terms of most public institutions in the country. We need to make sure we invest in those people. We need to make sure we develop the people that we have got in the bank to face the new challenges that we have got. So that's what I meant with fixing the bank. It's getting the bank to be ready for the new challenges facing us. That's my definition of fixing. In terms of the companies that I've invested, so it's well known that I used to own a private equity fund that I started from scratch. Wanted to prove to myself that I can actually work for myself. We've created that, and by the time we left, we have invested in seven portfolio companies. So I've resigned from all those boards, and I've sold all my stake in those businesses. If I say about I made personal sacrifices, I don't have any ownership in those companies. They don't consult with me at all. So I've tried to make a clean break, because there's a bigger challenge that I want to focus on that's help to contribute to economic prosperity for the country. That's why I said I have subordinated self-interest to national interest. As far as retrenchments are concerned, you need to understand what we are facing currently is once in a lifetime challenge. It's much deeper than most people realize from an economic and a financial point of view. If businesses don't do what they have to do, they won't survive. Many businesses are going to do what they have to do, but they're also not going to survive. So retrenchments are not things that those companies are considering easily. It's difficult to do that, but to save the business, you know, they probably need to do those type of interventions. So if they don't do that, the entire thing will probably collapse. It's difficult. But as management, you have got a responsibility to make sure that you get to the other side. And if you recover that, you can re-employ people again. But if you die and collapse, you are out of business entirely. There's no chance of employing future, people in future. So that's unfortunately what the reality around retrenchments, given the circumstances we face. Eagle FM, COVID-19, yes, it has made my job quite difficult. I had a 100-day plan. I wanted to do a number of things quickly, but I couldn't get hold of my stakeholders. I couldn't do certain things. So it does make it really difficult. It's a very difficult situation that we are facing. So I have to admit it has made my life difficult. It has made my onboarding difficult because all hands are currently on deck to save lives. And that's the right things to do. As far as Kelvin's question is concerned on the SME bank, the bank has done what it needs to do. Currently, it's in the hands of liquidators. There's very little that we can do as a bank at this point in time. It's in the hands of the courts. It's in the hands of liquidators. It's for them to go, see, go through and see it through now. So there's very little we can do as the Bank of Namibia. We have done what we are supposed to and that the other organs in the other agents must take care of what needs to happen. Uh, good morning, Governor. Uh, my name is Thierry. I'm a freelance journalist. I just have three questions. The first one is borders around the interest rates. I mean, you mentioned that interest rates currently are at an, at an all-time low for the past 30 years, but that doesn't seem to have stimulated uh, appetite for borrowing in, uh, in Namibia. Uh, despite the fact that the bank has been lowering uh, uh, the repo rate, um, I think for consecutive quarters now, do you think this this this, this uh, approach is working, or maybe we might need to look at other um, uh, options, maybe to stimulate uh, uh, the economy and also find options for those struggling companies that continue to re uh, retrench and send people home? Uh, the second one, uh, it's more on a fiscal aspect, but I think you could be able to to, ad to address it. Uh, the bailout package that we used, I think, uh, in the beginning when the government announced that they were going to release some sort of funds to assist uh, companies that were uh, facing viability problems, doesn't seem to have uh, worked or doesn't seem to have abated the retrenchment of people, cutting off salaries, and even some other smaller companies are, are closing. Giving a big compar a, good, a good comparison with our neighbors in South, South Africa, Africa, I think when South Africa did it, it simply has been scientifically uh, researched and also targeted certain sectors of the economy that were proven to really be struggling and employed many people. 
Do you think this, uh, the way we did it this side was appropriate? And, or do you feel like maybe there might actually be a, a, a need to stimulate further? The last one is on the common monetary area. I think uh, that coincidentally these are the same countries that are also in the, in, in, in the circle uh, uh, pool. There seem to have been drastic uh, loss of revenue. I think the last that the, the secretary, executive secretary spoke in March, she was saying um, wherever they were collecting something like 10 billion per month, uh, the possibility that now they'll be getting around 7 billion, which indicates a serious uh, loss in, in, in revenue. Do you think uh, that there's maybe need for Namibia to start looking at possibilities of diversifying its um, revenue streams, not necessarily um, uh, 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 relying on SACU alone? maybe looking at other possibilities, maybe take this or other industries. Thank you. Around interest rates, there seem to be a pessimistic narrative whether it's the transmission mechanism is working. Normally in any economy, when you take decisions, it takes between 18 to 24 months to transmit through the economy. So many people expect that you take an interest rate decision today and cut it by 25 basis points you need to be able to see the results tomorrow. I don't buy that. The actual results you will see that at this point in uh, time is, is very much probably relief if you have got a mortgage loan, if you have got a vehicle loan or any other high purchase. You could see it immediately in your pocket because when the banks, commercial banks reduce that, you could have that saving. But in terms of corporate lending and other transmission through the economy, we are probably a little bit impatient. What we need to do is a bit wait and see whether it's really working because it does take about 18 to 24 months. So I think the narrative is pessimistic uh, because we are impatient given the challenges that we are facing. It has offered relief definitely to all those people. Who have. And secondly, you are asking should we consider other options? Yes, we, we had other options. It's only not the interest rate decision that we have taken. Have you seen the relief measures that we have given to the banks to give people payment holidays? You've seen the interventions we have taken in terms of liquidity, in terms of capital requirements that the bank need to do. We've eased certain things. So it's not only interest rates that many people look at the interest rates and say that's the only thing we have done. No, it's a combination of the interest rates, it's relief measures, we have given to, to banks regarding liquidity, regarding capital, regarding many other requirements that we used to have. We've eased them so that we can help the economy grow. In. So that's around that. So the other one is SACU revenue and the loss of income. Generally, if you have got a house in your own household, you would like to be dependent on your own revenues and not be too reliant on that. But for good reasons or bad reasons, we have decided to, when we became independent, to be part of the common monetary area. And we have decided to pack our currency to the South African Rand. And many people don't know, you know, there are some, what are the benefits of being in an optimal currency area? Or, is this optimal or is it not optimal? At this point in time, from all the work the bank has done, is it's an optimal area for, 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 for Namibia for a couple of reasons. Do you think as a nation, the international world would look at us, there are credibility benefits for Namibia? Do you think as a nation and as, how much will it cost us just to make sure we build our economic system to be credible from a global point of view. So there are some credibility benefits that this membership is giving us. There are some trade benefits that's, that's giving to, to us. There are other benefits in terms of, if you look at the inflation where it is, I don't know whether you've seen the inflation in some of the neighboring countries that we have got. You put, as a monetary authority, look at whether you have got fine, sound and stable financial system, we probably tick that box. Do we have inflation that's relatively low? We probably would tick that box. The box that we need to work on, that's why I said I really want to focus on help secure economic recovery. So, yes, 
you can argue about whether this is beneficial to Namibia to us, and that's a prerogative of everyone to ask that question. From what the Bank of Namibia has done, the studies that we have done, is that this membership of the Common Monetary Area is serving as well, and the benefits currently are such that we need to stay within that regime. So the other one you were asking is around SME assistance. You know, the Ministry of Finance has announced some interventions, how to assist SMEs, and they also have targeted companies. They have said we're going to target the construction companies, we're going to target the tourism sector, because the recovery, when it comes, it's probably going to be all recovery. So those are the businesses that are going to take very long. They have been the hardest hit. So they're going to take long to recover. And there was a targeted intervention. If you ask me, was there room for improvement in that, I would say yes. We should probably have moved quite faster and quicker to release money and the assistance to those affected SME companies. So that is probably, and there are probably very good reasons why we even moved as fast as we should. But we also had a target program to save our SMEs together with the Social Security and the Ministry of Finance, they have got one. And a new one is currently being developed between the Ministry of Finance, commercial banks, and the Bank of Namibia, targeted at the SMEs. Good morning, Governor. My name is Ophana Chakra with the Namibian Sun. Um, having served on the high-level panel on the economy, what are some of the immediate recommendations that you think should be implemented to help resuscitate the economy? Um, and then also, um, what are your projections for growth, given the numbers that South Africa put out in the, uh, regarding the GDP figures? And also, the statement, you made a statement saying that um, I did not come to the bank to protect certain people. Could you also please just elaborate on that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Nina Minoirastis. I write for bottom line. Uh, yeah, I love the fact that you say you, you, you have a plan, but I'm more concerned on the economic plan. And again, you do not visit the SMEs and the informal sector. Are you still going to visit them? I've been listening to the people that you visited, the banks and everybody. But you do not visit the SMEs or the informal sector. Remember, everybody who's being retrenched now, they are all going to the informal sector. And we seem like we look at it like it does not exist. I think it's about time we recognize that it exists because it is now accommodating everybody what the formal sector is dumping out. Um, okay, uh, on the advisory notes that you say you have prepared, the advisory note on how to grow the economy, you gave them to whom? To finance, trade, national planning. Uh, then the second one is, uh, you said you guys are working on the growth strategy. How long should we wait? Because I'm see, I, I've seen your projects in Bank of Namibia saying that the economy might recover next year. Yeah, the statistical growth that you indicated, but growth based on what? Based on minerals, but it's still that one still depends on international market and the improvement on that. Then come back now to the sector that you came from. You say you are coming from the financial sector or the capital market. So you basically you understand the funding gap that exists in our market, especially for startups for SMEs, for the agricultural sector, and for the health sector. So that is why I want you to elaborate to say, when you look at our capital market, at what level are we? It's a very shallow market, it's dominated by government securities. Our stock exchange is shallow, there is nobody going public. And you say you want to modernize the financial market. In terms of derivatives that we have, we have a few of them, we are failing to in terms of securitization. Currently, our banks are struggling with liquidity, but you have a lot of non-performing loans that we can package and uh, uh, make them as a, a different product and bring more liquidities. So, there is a type of modernization I want you to, to, to tell me when you're saying you're going to modernize the, the financial market. Uh, then the last one, perhaps, the last one, perhaps. Uh, I want to emphasize on the fact to say that you started the venture capital where you are funding you are funding startups. Now, that is where I want you to touch in terms of funding. Because now we are, we are all just going to the banks for funding. 
That is what everybody knows. So what are you going to do there in terms of venture capital and equity, equity funding? What are, you, what are you going to do there? Because everybody I'm telling you, I get a lot of people asking about this uh, collateral thing about the banks. Because they saw what people know. But nobody knows that they can raise funding through the stock exchange. Nobody knows that the venture capital equity funding exists. So what are you going to do on that? Especially for the agriculture sector. We, we do not have enough money to fund it. So why don't we raise a bond? Why don't we use the stock exchange? So those are some of the questions that I have. Then the last one is this. There is a, the last one, last one. There is a theory developing, and it's not only developing from me and uh, me and Lazarus when we sit down, no. We also read the paper by the IMF saying, most of these developing countries, they are, they are becoming comfortable. Whenever they lack revenue for funding anything, they run and go borrow. That is basically what we do every financial year. So it's not just me. They released a paper, I think it was last week, borrowing versus your own generating capacity in your country. What is happening? Every financial year you go and borrow. But if you look at even if our, at our maturity right now, from now to 2030, it's all covered with maturities. And you are still, and you are the advisor to treasure. How do you tell them, because right now they need money, how do you tell them that we can't? Because 2030 until 2040, we have loans or bonds that are maturing. So how do you balance these things? Are you not having this power to tell them that find ways to generate revenue because we, because we can't borrow? You don't have that power because you are the advisor to treasure. Can't you do that? Namibia and Sam, from a high level panel recommendation point of view, we probably need to go back to Economics 101. How does one grow an economy? C plus I plus G. It's consumption, household spending. You have got government spending, and you have got the I standing for investments. If you really ask me, the quickest way of growing this economy is to focus on investing in the economy. Whether it's through local investments or whether it's attracting foreign direct investment. That's the quickest way. We won't get out of this on our own. We need some capital from outside into our economy. So if you look at consumption spending, household spending, households are highly indebted at this point in time. It's not going to help us big time. If you look at government spending, Erastus is telling us we are heavily indebted. We cannot borrow any more. That's what Eras to say. So the two areas where we can actually work on is our net exports, push our exports as far as we can. And you know what? The complexity of our exports has remained stagnant over the years. We only export four things. That's minerals, that's meat, that's fish, and that's grapes. And it has stayed for 30 years along those lines. And the income we get, all value addition is happening outside. We cannot really pay higher salaries on, on that. So the big and quickest one is to focus on investments. And for that reason, you have seen that the president, when he announced a new cabinet, has created a position for investments, promotion, investment promotions. I don't know whether you guys realize that that's such a position that's been created because that's one of the recommendations came out of that. And if we need to go further and need to industrialize our economy, what investments do we need to focus on? We need to focus on getting electricity or energy right. We need to focus on getting our energy water right. Every time we get good rains, we forget about that we are in an arid country by and large. We need to get that right. And we need to get investments in the productive sectors of the economy. We've been focusing very much on the consumptive side of the investments. So what we need to, to do is to focus on that. Hopefully, that gives you the gist of the recommendations that we have got. We've got other recommendations that have been accepted around the fishing. Uh, and as a high-level panel, you have seen, we have said, what needs to happen in terms of fishing rights and quotas, that we need to auction that, that was accepted. We also have probably seen a sovereign wealth fund that we have recommended, that has been accepted. There's a couple of others that are coming, but the big one, if you really ask them, and put a gun to my head and said, what's the quickest one, is investments, as far as I'm concerned. 
The second question is around growth. You know, the Bank of Namibia has come out with the growth numbers. Israel can give you the figures. Israel just give the economic outlook after this to, to, to you. So that's our position as far as growth is concerned. Everybody is asking us, this year you're going to have a contraction of 8.1%. And next year we are forecasting a growth of about 2 or 2.2 or 2.1%. 2 2.1. 2 Thank you, Gigi. So where is it going to come from? It's going to come from three really places. It's Erastus, you also asked this question. So it's going to be low waste effects. Um, currently, the economy has been open only up to February, March. And it's sort of, it is switched off between April and up to now. So if you say we only had really cognitive activity for three of the nine months, six months, nothing has almost happened. Anything that's going to give us an economic activity in more than six months next year, we are coming from a very low base. That's going to help us in terms of the numbers. So you said statistical, that's probably right. That's a basic fact. The second one is we expect mining is going to recover. You also know what has happened on the diamond mining side. The new vessel has been withdrawn from production at this point in time, and they're busy with a new one that they want to put into operation. So we think diamonds is going to improve. And the third one we expect is on the agricultural sector. So everybody is asking us, where is this 2.1% going to come next year? That's basically where it's going to come from. Low base effects, an improvement in agriculture, and recovery in, in diamond mining. So let me talk to Erastus' SME bank and the SME sector. I have a, a visited and reach out to key stakeholders except SMEs. That's your contention. There's one reason why I've reached out to the NCCI. The NCCI is the official organization representing the formal and informal sector. Someone like Martin Shipanga is quite involved. He's got a business in Katatura. He understands that. And one of the reasons why we tried to understand was to sit down with the NCCI and say, What's happening in the private sector, whether it's formal private sector, whether it's informal sector. And that's one of the reasons why we are currently working together with the Ministry of Finance and commercial banks on a facility for SME sector. So it's not a case that we've ignored that. We've reached out, probably not to the people you want us to, but we've reached out to some organized institutions. You talk about the funding gap that we have got. That, that's true. Currently, one of the reasons, you know, everybody thinks we just need to get debt. And when you run a business, you need to have some debt, but you also need to have some equity. There is such a big gap in opportunity for equity financing in Namibia. And people don't actually realize that. Most businesses are currently struggling in terms of just getting working capital, paying salaries, paying for the rent of electricity, and everybody is trying to run to the bank instead of saying, can I not get some equity financing? Somebody who is prepared to take up some equity in my business, give me the money that I require to bridge over this period, difficult period. When things are normal, I can buy back my, my shares in the business. There is a place for equity financing, but we all want just to go to debt. Uh, that, that's one of the ways we would like to think about how does one really innovate. You also need to understand that the Bank of Namibia has availed, is it 50 or 100 million for the Venture Capital Fund to DBN? 100 million to the DB, to DBN. And DBN, the Minister of Finance actually is two weeks ago, has announced that financing, and that was to assist SME sector. So it, it, maybe it's a case that we are not evangelizing this enough. We don't tell the people. We should probably communicate what's being done for the SME sector. It's probably not what everybody expects, but it's definitely not something that's being forgotten. That's a big focus from the bank and from the government side. Modernizing the financial system. I think there's a great opportunity to look at venture capital fund, look at equity financing, we definitely need to look at 
you know, particularly if you look at the new world that we are moving in, the new technologies that we have got, what is suitable from what's happening in that space for Namibia? That's what we need to understand and try and get the bank to be ready for that. All right, there's a question from our Facebook page. Um, a viewer who's watching this, he's asking, um, given that the country's economy is severely affected by COVID-19, what is the central bank's plan in place to recover and catch up with the economy, stability of the country after COVID-19 fades? I hope the question is clear, that's what he's saying. Calvin and then Emil. Yes, sure, well, thank you. Uh, I'll be interrupting with your, with your uh, counterparts, your colleagues, the finance ministry and also uh, are you in a position maybe to tell us where are we in terms of uh, the, the borrowings that we want to get from the IMF. We know that the team uh, was trying to do some studies and all that, trying to see if we can get this money. Do we have any letters that you can share with us? Um, Emil again, Mr. Governor. Um, we are aware of the, or I am aware of the relief that the central bank has afforded to the banks and then subsequently following up. But there are people, Governor, this is more a, a human interest <coughs> sorry, question for, from my side because I spend a lot of time in the community. And there are people that still cannot afford to, to get a loan from the bank. Um, and we are, we are also aware that the bank has gone on or on many occasions and condemned crowdfunding. After, this, after such uh, statements from the bank, you see a silence for two weeks and then there's another one again. And the, the statements by the bank is more or less the same. This is illegal, it needs to stop, or we have condemned this and this um, initiative in the form of a, of a crowdfunding. As the responsible party, how are you ensuring that these laws are actually implemented? Because it's quite sad to see that the people are so desperate by the effects of COVID-19 and possibly due to, to desperation is engaging in these activities and further it's harming them more. So apart from saying we condemn this and this is illegal, what is your institution doing to see that we actually stop this and that the poor people are not uh, feeling this threat further. Thank you, sir. Uh, just one question, Kazena. You spoke of investment. I'm sure you've done enough research to target certain sectors that you want investment in. But I, I don't know whether it's fair for me to ask you this, but I suppose you can be able to attempt. The, the communication of systems in Namibia, I mean, the one thing that keeps investors away are the systems. I mean, if you talk of visas, uh, maybe now that uh, it's faster to register a business, but it takes slightly longer to register a, a business, maybe to, to acquire a visa, a business visa or an operating visa within one phase. What then are you, uh, is, is being done to make sure that these systems communicate to each other? Whilst government or Namibia is looking for investments, government is also making sure that um, the, the visa processes are also um, uh, responding to that. Because I think for quite some time, uh, NCCI has been complaining about this, saying that that's one of the major impediments to investments in Namibia. Thank you. Sorry, Governor, my name is just going to be very quick. Um, the World Health um, forecast is that COVID-19 will be with us for five years maximum. Is there such a plan that the, that the central bank has, at least, that can, you know, just as a provisional backup or some sort of thing of roadmap to see what might be a possible case scenario. And just as a slight expansion on that, what would your worst scenario look like in terms of if this if COVID nineteen pandemic will still be with us for five years approximately um, going ahead. So I know it's just a bit of spitballing but yeah. So the first one is what plan do we have for recovery? And we need to understand, if we need to answer this one, we need to get back to what is our mandate. We cannot do everything that anyone expects us to do. So our mandate is price stability and financial stability and advice to the economy. So our first thing you probably need to say is, from a monetary point of view, what is our game plan? And that you can read into the decisions we take around interest rates, right? And so far you have seen what we have done. Then on the financial system, we also have the responsibility. And there we have given some relief measures to the banks. We have looked at the capital in the banks. We have looked at liquidity in the banks. 
we have eased some of the requirements to help us through that. So those are the plans that we have got. And the third responsibility that we have got as a bank is to act as advisor to government. And this growth story is we are currently engaged with the Minister of Finance and the Director General of National Planning. They are actually primarily responsible to crafting a growth strategy for the country. As the Bank of Namibia, we are assisting with the necessary research. We are assisting with some technical aspects of, of, of that entire thing that we actually want. So we are playing a significant role in terms of helping the country crafting and finalizing that growth strategy. And where we are currently, we need to ask the Minister of, of Finance on, on that one. Where are we with the IMF loan or facility? You know, many people actually don't understand that. The question is based put to the Minister of Finance. But we are responsible from a borrowing point of view and we've got a role to play. And I'm not so concerned like many people are. There's a quota that Namibia is entitled to. If we package our story in a way that is credible, we'll most likely get it. But where we are on that one, Erastus, or who po po posed that question, please ask the Minister of Finance where we are on that one. Access to finance. Emil Saibib, you are quite right. You know, we have got a responsibility to look at illegal financial schemes. We can't tolerate that because people are actually losing quite a lot of money. The moment we allow those pyramid schemes and illegal financial schemes to continue and people are losing money. So the other point that you're also making is what are we doing? Because people are desperate currently. They want living. This crowdfunding is not right. What we need to do at the bank is to understand what is that that we can do to understand. Is there research that we can do? In South Africa, they have, from a central banking point of view, done some interesting piece of work around stock values. And they are looking at whether they should, considering whether they should actually allow stock values or not. Is there some work that we need to do? Because we see more and more people are engaged in those activity of crowdfunding or illegal financial schemes. What is there that can be legitimized? And some research we need to do as the Bank of Namibia. The other one around investments is, there is some realization around that. That's why the president has appointed or created an investment promotion ministry. And the whole thing around ease of doing business in Namibia is definitely going to be addressed through that ministry. I've got no doubt about that. That's the realization. There is a very good reason why the president has decided to create that ministry of investment promotion and also to look at ease of doing business and our competitiveness as, as a nation. As far as your question is concerned, Clearly, in terms of our modeling and the work that we have done on COVID and how long the duration of this whole thing is going to be, we looked at 2020 and we said, you know, what's the worst case going to be in terms of the economic output? We said the realistic scenario is going to give us a contraction of 8.1%. And we said in the worst case, was it 12? Israel can give you that exact number. Just give them. So it's going to take long. So how do I see that the bank doesn't have a position, but I've got a position? I see three distinct phases of this COVID-19. The first phase is contain this disease. The second phase is a recovery phase. And the third phase that I'm seeing is what I'm calling the recuperating phase. So the recovery phase is also going to be very uneven. For some sectors, they're going to rebound particularly some private sector companies, in as much as we say that, you know, retrains are not, retrenchments are not so good. Most private, private sector companies and businesses that have cut out all the fat in the businesses and that are currently lean, they should have a relatively quicker recovery if they're in the right sector. But other sectors, like tourism, they're going to take long. That's going to be an L recovery, unfortunately. Because you need quite a lot of confidence for people to get onto planes. You need to make it easy for people to fly. So 
I can't give you a really a five year. I really hope we don't get to a five year situation. I really hope we can get effective therapy or a vaccine so that we can get back to normal life. And my forecast is normal life is from the first half, 2021. Um, good morning, Governor. Um, and congratulations on your annual piece in office. Um, my name is Lazarus Mukishi. I report for the Namibian newspaper. I think my colleague Erasmus has asked a couple of questions that I already put in the book. I've got two or three main questions. Um, we've done an analysis of the bank's um, loans and advances that have given out, and we've seen that most of them are locked out in mortgage loans. I just wanted to understand from, and we've seen that that sector is also pushing up quite a number of um, non-performing loans as well. So I just wanted to understand whether, is it about time we put maybe a cap on how much the banks can borrow to, um, to fund mortgages? Um, and also the second one, I think the IMF has also, and its assessment, its previous assessment has said um, the commercial banks are funding too much non-productive sector. Um, leaving out um, factors such as, I mean, sectors such as manufacturing and the results of the market. So I just, I, I think a couple of days ago, the Nigerian, just to give an example, Nigerian Central Bank um, has instructed commercial banks to try and up um, the loans and advances they give to the agricultural and the manufacturing sector. Is this something that you'd like to do in your turn as well? Um, and then the last two questions are somewhat kind of personal. Um, so I think two years for you. So you 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 were in private, you retired, you went into business, and then it come you sold out all your um, interest in your in, in your company. So I just wanted to understand how much did you sell it for? And then secondly, um, I think it's for probably also such a short term for you. Um, my understanding of what the president when the president announced your appointment to say you're going to be in office for. Um, year and 18 months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I know um, from a selling point of view, it's probably a good thing to do, but do you think selling out all your business interest just for an 18 months job is really worth it, or are you looking at the possible reappointment, or will you promise something good if, if you do a good job? <laughs> yes, I'm going to repeat my question again, the last question I gave you. If you go look at our debt, our maturity profile, just go take a look now. From now until 2030, we have bonds that are maturing. And you are the advisor to Treasury, whether to borrow or not. So is it feasible? Where are you going to fit it? Where are you going to get the money to repay them? Because last year you redeemed the bond, and I'm sure you were praying to say, nobody liquidated their position. Roll over to the next one. So tell me how. I ask you this question to say that can't you put your foot down looking at maturity profile until 2040 to say let us not borrow but find capacities to generate. You've been around Namra until now it's not even, I don't know, but you're still borrowing for government when you can see that the maturity profile of our bonds have no capacity for us to pay sometimes. So they, I want you to say something on that because you advise them whether to borrow or not. You know that the economy is not performing. So, you are liberating that because you know better in these things. Right, so thank you very much, Israel. Thank you very much, Gabriel. So Lazarus, let me start with your questions around the bank loans and advances. You're quite right. Currently, if you look at the overall total loan book, mortgages account for about 50% of all the loans and advances. And that is a function of a severe shortage that we have got in the country. So if you just look at the number of shacks that we have got in the country, the demand for housing is real. So the banks are responding to a real demand. It's not the case that they just don't want to finance mortgages for the sake of financing mortgages. So my own view is, when I did the walkabout to the banks and I said to him, given the challenges that you are facing, what is that that you guys are doing? And you know, most of the MDs and the chairpersons of the banks, they told me, we want to put people in the homes and in the cars. Mr. the governor, what do you think we're gonna do with all the homes if we repossess them? So we have got every intention to keep our people in the homes and in the cars. 
Yes, there are cases where we need to do what we have to do, but our first priority is to make sure that we keep them and help them. So that, that, that's probably my NPLs are understandably increasing because many people are losing their jobs. So it's understandable. Remember, we are not dealing with a normal situation. We are dealing with a very abnormal once in a century event. So if you expect a normal sort of type economy, you are probably not in the real place. So the banks are responding to a real demand as far as housing is concerned. The banks are not ignorant and aware of the fact that NPLs are increasing. We are also seeing that in the reports of the bank. But we understand that. We had given some relief to the banks. We said at a normal situation, you probably had to have a default, a uh, non-performing loan of about 4%. We moved that to about 6%. And people are losing jobs. And what we need to do is probably monitor the situation and see, is there anything we can do further to, uh, to assist banks and Namibians? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. The second one is commercial banking too much in non-productive sector and they need to look at loans and advances in obviously if you answer if you listen to me what this economy is requiring is investment in the productive side of the economy but if there is a commercial transaction that the banks consider and they think the thing is standing on its own you know we cannot go and tell the banks you can't do that but what we like to see is actually we are very, I'm very much concerned currently about corporate lending because corporate lending is slowing as we've seen the past first two quarters of this year. So and that tells us the economy is not growing. So the banks are basically there to take money from those who have and pass it on to people who want to invest or those who don't have. So that's the sort of the transmission belt that the banks have got. And lending is key and particularly lending in the productive side of the economy. That's what we need. Finally, your question around the personal will remain personal, how much I sold for, but the one around 18 months I can easily contextualize. In terms of the Act, the Bank of Namibia Act, if any governor comes in whilst the term of the previous governor has not expired, he needs to serve the term out. So that the Shimi had about 18 months before his final term expired. So I was appointed to, to meet the requirements of the law for 18 months. So let us look at what's happened after the 18 months, whether the appointing authority has got a different view around that. I'm pretty sure, if you ask my own view, he would probably have appointed me for the full five years had it not been for that requirement that he needs to meet. Right, debt maturity profile. We had a long debate the other day around debt maturity profiles of most of the African countries. And it's not only a Namibian problem. The only country on the continent that got a very good debt maturity profile of average around seven years is South Africa. I don't know whether you are aware of that. And if you look at, and many people are, probably have this narrative that's one-sided around the debt maturity profile of the country. And yes, you know, make, we have got maturities that we need to deal with. But what you need to do, Gabriel, is probably look at the borrowing plan of the government for this new budget. The Minister of Finance went out and said the expenditure is going to be about 71 billion Namibian dollars. And as an advisor, the Bank of Namibia needs to assist that we raise that 71 billion this year. And we're going to raise that the domestic market and on the domestic market in the first five months we've raised already 60 percent of that 10 billion that we 60 percent so we have raised already i'm not so concerned as you are whether we'll be able to raise the money that we are supposed to raise for government for its expenditure so the first part in terms of the domestic market we are quite pleasantly surprised by how much we've raised. We've raised about 60% thereof for the money that we need to raise domestically. 
Then we need to raise money from the African Development Bank. I am also confident that we should be able to do that. And then we need to look at international DFIs. And for that, you need to ask the Minister of Finance how far are we with the IMF RFI. Do we have a role to play? I'm pretty sure the Bank of Namibia has advised the government on we have done a study recently about the sustainability of the debt. We've done a very comprehensive analysis of debt sustainability of the country. And we have submitted that report to the Minister of Finance. It's not our mandate to go and say debt is unsustainable, we should stop this. Our mandate is do the exercise and give the output and recommendations to the Minister of Finance. So we have done a comprehensive debt sustainability analysis report. Two, three weeks ago, we have submitted that to the Minister of Finance. And it's for the Minister. Remember, we've got an advisory role. We cannot go and implement and execute certain things. That's not our mandate. Hopefully, Gabriel, that, that answers your questions.